speaking of that too, people came with their laptops to do a workshop later as part of this presentation. Great. So we have that. Matt has uh, put together something on that. So it is 6.30. Um, and we're just a little behind, but we planned, uh, as far as the presentation, we did want to have some discussion up front. So, so I think we'll have plenty of time for the for a good amount of time, more than half an hour of um, workshop time. Sure. May I? I'm really excited. My next question was going to be, um, is this virtualizable? Uh, that is, and I see you logging into VMware. Does that mean that you're logging into virtual des desktop and, and going to run Enscape in that environment? Yes. Dynamite. Yeah. So I'm also a product of the 70s and I use words like dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it. And those, I think the three of you were new today too? Uh, right, do you want to say your names, fun fact, and what got you into the profession? So it's for its architect. I'm just looking at expand exposure to different programs. We've been minimally looking at that. And it does help you. Yeah. And it's just looking to expand. Yep. Yeah. Might pick a good time to do it. No <laughs> fun fact, though. <laughs> no fun fact? Don't have anything. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah. Um, I work at Anvehar Architects. We're just starting to roll out Enscape, so that's why I'm here to learn more about it. Um, particularly animation with Enscape, um, doing a quick animation process is really would be really helpful. Um, I got into the profession primarily because I was interested in visual arts. Yes, I, I don't have a fun fact either. No fun fact. Okay. <laughs> and finally. Tatiana? Tatiana? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, I, uh, I work at creative agency, so I have an urban planning master's degree, and so I'm just gonna start learning new software. So <laughs> every other year, new, new program, new rendering engine, so it's kind of like, okay, new one. And uh, I kind of like a lot interactivity of Inkscape, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, lights, very nice and so maybe so I was we were discussing it before and it just came uh, like you know comparing the array mm -hmm. it's like everybody recognized the quality um, it actually like takes time so you know it's just interesting that what people are using now like um, time wise you know compared you know quality and time you know, right. together right. right yeah so it's a lot of fun to learn new stuff. <laughs> like come to the right place. So Matt, well, I'm going to hand over to Matt in just a sec, but Matt will show a little bit of animation. It won't be the focus for today. And really, Enscape in general is, is most of the focus, right? We're going to do some Photoshop uh, post-production as well. Um, but the goal is just to think about this. this uh, like I said, the software just has changed everything, at least in our office, that everybody can just plug in their Revit model and in real time, making changes and watching it as you're walking down the hallway. So we also have a SketchUp workflow and Rhino workflow, um, but it's just, it's just changing the way we see everything these days. So I guess with that, Matt, I'll stop talking and you can get into it. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, my, my fun facts. Um, I'm not completely architecture free in my background. I spent three years at Studio AMD. I don't know, is anybody familiar with AMD? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Was that John Peston? Oh, you're Michael. Yep. We should talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds ominous. Um, <laughs> um, so it was all 3D Studio Max in V-Ray um, all day, every day. So walking into my role at SMMA, it's a whole different uh, workflow, a whole different pipeline, um, and a completely different role. So trying to find some ways to to satisfy the needs of the firm and keep elevating and progressing our visualization stuff um, has really led to a, a much more a bigger embrace of, of Enscape. And we're going to talk right now a little bit about the history of computer graphics and how we got to where we are now. Um, and this can this conversation can go back 
much further than 1993, but this is a good cutoff point for the sake of efficiency. <laughs> so missed, right? And trying to find screen grabs of video games where no one is holding a gun, it's a little tricky. And I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll just do missed. This is a good one. This is this is a great example. Um, and these were gorgeous and, and arguably still are. So one of the things you'll notice in here is that the shadows are really consistent. There's almost no reflections on anything. Um, you guys can all see that, right? Yeah. Actually, Michael, is, there's a seltzer or a water. Um, that would be awesome, thanks. So 1993, this is what we can think of as a traditional roster, G-buffer render, where light does not bounce. It is nowhere close to being physically accurate. It's an object first rendering method where it just determines where objects are. Um, and then shading really happens after the fact. And it's through a lot of cheats and, and tweaks that you can kind of get something that seems like light and seems like shadow and kind of seems like reflections, but it's nowhere close to being physically accurate. So Toy Story in 1995, um, again, if you look at the shadows and you look at the shading, it's still really flat. There's not a lot of bounce light going on, if there is any. And if there was, it was completely faked. They were able to art direct this right up until really recently. That was their whole workflow, was being able to control shading and control lighting in a, in a really purposeful way that still had nothing to do with reality. And with our role as interior designers and architects and representation, there is a need for a closer representation. <coughs> and still being able to render this stuff in real time, this was nowhere close to being real time. This was hours and hours and hours on giant render farms that were <coughs> energy intensive and the manpower and the render wrangling that had to go into it. Um, was, was absolutely admirable. Fast forward to 2001. So from 1995 to 2001, we're seeing some soft shadows. We're seeing some bounce light. You can see the underside of Sully here being lit up by the floor. You can see some volumetric lights happening and there's fur. Fur was a big deal. This was a really fun time from mid 90s to the mid 2000s every year something new was happening and there was a new effect a new thing that you could do also around 2001 you might recognize this one from the office this was this you didn't work on this one did you no okay. this was a steve Olds image you guys all know who steve Olds is the godfather of modern architectural visualization he was a traditional artist and this was him working with Studio AMD in the really early days, taking those sensibilities of composition and lighting and space and form and using the new technologies of the computer to create images like this. This, this might have been a V-Ray render, this might have been a Brazil render, I'd have to look into it, but this was done on the computer and it still took hours and hours and hours to render. Now, Monsters U was a turning point, and it's really funny to look at the original Monsters Inc. and then <coughs> see what happened in Monsters U, because in Monsters U, they went ray traced. It was no longer a G-buffer object first render. This is where they went with physically accurate, physically predictable rendering. Light bounces better here, specular highlights respect the rest of the scene. One of the things with a traditional G-buffer roster render is that reflections are faked. You'll get something like a box or a sphere of a scene and then everything in it is sort of reflecting that same box or sphere. Whereas in this, they're actually reflecting what the light is doing and what the geometry is doing in the scene and it's more unified and coherent and cohesive. One of the things Pixar was doing early on was that they didn't want to lean on compositing to do a lot of effects 
and monsters you as a complete 90 degree turn into using compositors like Nuke um, to be able to tweak and, mas and massage a scene. Seeing nice contact shadows, contact shadows, um, soft shadows. It's a more robust, cohesive scene. Now 2014, this is where Octane and path tracing made a huge splash. Is anybody familiar with Octane? Um, so Octane is a path tracer, which is like an evolution of ray tracing. So in ray tracing, you're taking the camera and every pixel in that frame, so if you have 19, 20 by 1080 pixels, every pixel is shooting rays out into the scene, <coughs> finding objects, finding light sources, and finding how everything bounces around. Path tracing takes it to another level where it's shooting out thousands or millions of rays in a much more generalized way and it slowly condenses down into something that's even more photorealistic. What Octane did is that it ran off of GPUs. And if you think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin screwed everything up a couple of years ago. Yeah. GPU prices went through the roof and stayed that way, and we're still sort of waiting for them to come back down. Um, but you could cram two, three, four, you could get up to eight GPUs into one machine, and all of a sudden you've got a virtual camera that you could kind of look around a scene with. And it's crazy fast and crazy good. Not that great yet for an architectural visualization pipeline, um, for a number of reasons, but it was amazing. This was a scene that we did for a guy who was doing documentaries for Nova and he was trying to develop an app for the Coliseum. Um, and when he handed us the model, he said, listen, the guy who gave this to me said that it came from the movie Gladiator. So, so don't let this get out in public. I'm like, all right. And at some point we went and started looking for another model the Coliseum and literally found this on the SketchUp warehouse. So whoever had told this guy that is having taken some liberties. But this was just taking a straight SketchUp warehouse model, dropping it into Octane, and getting a pretty respectable, pretty reasonable render without tweaking any materials or really doing anything. And now this, I was curious because that was a, it's a full path tracer. Like I said, it takes about four to eight GPUs to get anywhere close to real time and there's still a wait. And then looking at what Inkscape does as a hybrid path tracer. So it takes a little bit of the G buffer roster stuff from the old days and takes some path tracing stuff that's going on now and takes the best of both worlds and tries to find the most efficient solution. And this is in real time. This is crazy. It's the, almost the exact same thing. I took the same HDR lighting sphere, so it's the exact same lighting conditions. The only thing that um, I had to tweak was the, the solar flare. The octane flares are really nice straight out of the box, so this guy got dropped into After Effects or you could do it in Photoshop or whatever. So the validity of using Enscape to get something that is very physically accurate is there. It's this long path that got us here. The only real difference, or there's a number of real differences, but one of the big differences um, in materials, compositing, and passes that V-Ray still wins out and Octane is still winning out as, you might be giving that up, but for the rapid turnaround time on these, it's well worth it. So, to take a quick look at some of the lighting stuff that is in um, that is in uh, Enscape, there's a quick demonstration here. And one of the, one of the amazing things we're we're a cloud-based firm. So I could be working on a really low end. I could be working on a really low end machine here, but out wherever our servers live, 
um, Enscape lives, so it doesn't really matter what we're doing. And there's a couple of, of quirks. Bam. One of the things I did early on, when I just cracked it open, tried to see what was going on, and they were asking for renders and asking for all this stuff. Octane, because it's really physically accurate, doesn't use traditional computer lights. Anything that you're going to be lighting with uses a material so that it's emitting from a three-dimensional object. It's a little bit more physically accurate. Wait, so there's no light to fix your No. There is. Watch. Okay. It's fun. <laughs> <clears throat> so our friend, there's some pretty standard stuff here, like a regular spotlight. Um, and there's a couple things that you might have to look out for. One is how it measures or represent, represents light intensity across the board. So spotlights use candelas. It gets a little bit different. And you can see here what their traditional spotlight looks like. It's nothing outrageous, it's just a spotlight. This is fine, sometimes you use them. There's no barn doors, there's no cookies, you can't use a mask on them to, say if you want a square spotlight, um, you'd have to literally model a cube around it and then be able to cast a shadow through it. So like physically, I keep saying physically, but having real geometry there for it to cast shadows through. Um, it's that, but it does use IES profiles. So these next two guys are examples of what happens when you actually use an, an IES profile. It's pretty accurate, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, so when you use the IES profile, are you, we, I was playing around with this earlier, just to this very like basic level. Do you still have to control an intensity, or is it taking the intensity that the IES file is assigning? It still gives you a, a um, so let's look at that. So we still have a, a luminous intensity slider, and if I turn that down, okay. you can see what happens. So it's really just taking the shape that the IES is giving you. Just the distribution of the light. The distribution, it's not. Right. It's okay. not giving so you. So it's not that. OK. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> much the same with camera repeat, right? You have the full intensity to it. Uh, but not knowing what, yes and no, not knowing where, like, that middle point of the slider is. I mean, in, yes, in theory, it, it, it act, can act like a dimmer, but is it, if you're using the IES file, you already too bright or you're too yeah. <laughs> um, And it gets a little bit more complicated, too, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, and you can notice when you do add an IES profile, the representation changes. So the, the plain out-of-the-box spotlight, just a regular spotlight, you add an IES profile to it, it gets broken up, so you know, so you know it's actually doing something. Um, so those are those guys. And just as a quick note, these can be really tricky to place. For example, you may have already experienced this, so I'll take a spotlight. You first have to click on the ground, and drag it up. then drag it up. And then it does this, which is crazy. And normally, if you press up or down in SketchUp, you can constrain to an axis. But it's still nigh impossible to get it to actually place correctly. And then it does this other weird thing where it wants you to do it twice. And on their forums, their people will try to justify it, um, which is interesting. I guess they're still working on it. The trick to doing this, are you ready? 
You ready? You might want to write this down. Do a line first. <laughs> Just do a line. Yeah. Then do the spotlight. So now you get something to constrain it to, and then it snaps back to the line, click twice, oh. and it's perfectly vertical up and down. Like a tripod. Like a tripod, yeah. yeah. So that's how, you know, you can, if you're placing anything horizontally, I was doing some horizontal edge lit glass lights the other day and just do it horizontally, it's no big deal. If you put it in a plane or something, would it line up? It would still line up with the plane. Um, so, you still the plane. so if we, you know, created a plane, it's no, the same. No, I need a, like a ceiling. Putting lights. Yeah, and you're just snapping to it. The one thing that you do want to do, if you are snapping to a ceiling, because um, you don't want it to intersect with the geometry, I'll snap it to the ceiling and then move it down by a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch, or just move it off of if I'm going to a light fixture snap it to the light fixture and then move it down an eighth of an inch, you're good to go. All right. Um, yeah, and if I talk too fast or if you guys get lost, just shout. Like I eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff all day, so. Do you work in Revit too? I don't. I sort of do a little bit, begrudgingly. Um, that's my... That's my weakness. I'm not just curious. It's good. Um, <clears throat> and apparently, uh, the Enscape in Revit doesn't have all this stuff. It just uses normal Revit lights, and normal Revit IES stuff. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, so this is their line light, <coughs> which barbells. Like it gets heavier at both ends and doesn't really illuminate all that well. I haven't found a decent reason to use this yet, so I don't. <laughs> all right. Now this is, this is an actual uh, bit of geometry with a luminous material on it. So if I, grab that material and check out our Enscape material options. If you just turn on self-illumination, you can turn the luminous up. It's measured in candelas per meter squared. And you can adjust the intensity. Yes, sir? Does the luminous um, apply to all the faces that are modeled? Yes, sir. It applies to everything that the material is applied to. So to demonstrate, if we So here's our box, and if I just go down to the bottom of the box and apply that luminous line light material to it, you can see it's not really doing anything yet until I look at it, and now that part is emitting. Just that face. Just that face. All right. There is, um, and it hasn't really been, I think if I move my camera away and then move back. Yeah, I might have to, oop, all right, here's the example. Skipping ahead on you, Mike. So you can see this plane right here isn't emitting anything right now, but if I move my camera down, Boom, now it turns on. So that's one of the weird quirks of Enscape being the hybrid path tracer. It's doing a lot of 
<coughs> roster things and optimizing so it's not always calculating everything all the time. It's really well optimized. Now, if you can't see a light, is it still going to affect the scene and how is this going to affect my animations and my visualizations? Um, we can... I have, an, I have an animation example I can show you in a second. Actually, uh, you know what? I can do one of these. When you get back in there, can you show how you would change the color temperature? Yes, sir. So this was... Um, <laughs> what do you use to assemble the video? I use After Effects and Premiere. So this can run through the entire thing, and this is an After effects -y little bit that had to get synced up. But for all the corner turns in other rooms and all the situations where we don't all automatically see a light, it doesn't affect the animation, it doesn't affect the visualization. It's fine. So, what if you're going from an, if you have an exterior perspective and it looks like none of the lights inside are on? You're starting good, from the outside and going to the end. Good question. Um, then there's, you actually have to load the IES profiles for every single lighting fixture in the space <coughs> to get it to show properly. If you if you if it has IES profiles and you have them and you want to be accurate, start there. If you one of the things that it has a hard time doing is balancing their artificial lights with sunlight. Mm -hmm. So there is a trick to that, and it's essentially under their settings, under advanced and artificial light brightness. So if I look around, their artificial lights are the spheres, the spots, all these guys. Everything else is luminous materials. So the artificial light brightness, you can have a global adjustment that'll blow out all of your, or reduce all of the artificial lights in the scene. Yeah. So if you're from the outside of a building and it's daytime and you want to see what the lights are doing on the inside, just crank up the artificial light brightness so it fights better. But if you're doing an animation, the settings don't change when you have to make the change. You'd have to Crossfade, you got to do some creative work around. Okay. Yeah. It even, I mean, that would be the case even if you were using V-Ray or anything else. That's a tough, yeah. that's a tough, like an exposure. That's why I'm hoping this would have a selection. Yeah. I mean, the automatic exposure thing is nice. Yeah. But, um, so. How do you um, work with bounce light on materials? Do you add extra light or do you add a different color inside So to, let's take a look. Glad you asked. And also notice like this, to have a, a black box studio light set up where you have a completely neutral environment to see what your lights are doing. Um, the best way of doing it, I just adjust the time so it's night. So that's step one to find this absolutely neutral spot, really helpful. So as you're going through lighting your buildings, this is a good place to start. Um, and then just remember to turn it back in the daytime, otherwise your interior department is going to say, why is everything at night? I thought we were looking at lights. Um, all right, cool. So let's take... Do I still have my box? Oops, I just have a quick question. So, the, so I don't know this program very well. So the main concept is, so every time you're making a move, in your SketchUp model, on the left side, like in real time, it's rendering it. And the more, the more objects you have, or the more lighting you have within your model, the slower the left image will start to appear. Is that true? Um, I haven't really seen it get that bad yet. Okay. And we've thrown outrageous stuff at it. I mean, so it's just moving with you. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I also have a, you know, when I'm working locally, um, I've got a GTX 1080 Ti, which is a really beefy graphics card. If you've got something on the lower end, you might find a ceiling. So, um, keep that in mind. It's still faster than, than waiting an hour yeah. for rendering. Totally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then make a change after yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So to, to look at how bounce light might affect something, um, let's take our guy here. So there's our box on the ground, and we'll keep an image. There's our line light. Let's actually do a new one here. Let's make him white. I always did this example with cue balls and, pool, and green pool tables. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll use our frame. While you're doing that, the other question I've had is so any project I've ever used Headscape on, you know, I, you do these, I get these walkthroughs, or this, you know, I get sent from an architect, it's like the, the .exe file that they've exported. It always looks fuzzy. It's like the, it's like the pixelated version, like when you're walking through it, almost kind of like looks down here on the left, where it's, it's not photo, like photorealistic. Is there a step, another step here that gets it more realistic looking than just kind of a useful visualization tool, or? Um, are they sending screen grabs or are they sending full renders? They're so, I mean, I've just been sent like an application that I open up and run on my computer that's the entire Enscape file. Oh, yeah, the, the Enscape Can I, Yeah. Yeah. Um, that depends a lot on your graphics card. Oh. That one does. So, like, this is, this is our laptop and it, it does pretty well. When we try to do VR off of this, we have to dump a lot of the quality down to about halfway. It's still engaging and it's still an experience, and you can still sit there and, and create, you know, make design decisions. But um, but yeah, no, there there is a little different quality. I've done the VR, I've done the VR, a different project where I've walked through, and it all just feels like it's about half, like it's like that medium quality setting. Where, okay, so yeah. there is a high quality, like photorealistic, like you were showing there in yeah. real time. Um, yeah, it, it's as good as your graphics card will look like. What are the uh, baseline requirements for like a VR workstation setup in terms of RAM and processing and graphics card? I think the minimum right now is a GTX 1060. Start, st start there. <laughs> GTX, yes. Um, and then and, and Scape on the website will have their minimum system requirements. Um, don't don't try to go with a quadro. If anybody tries to sell you a quadro, they're just trying to get your money. They're salesmen. We don't know what quadro is. is you don't need. It's the, it's the big money one that you don't okay. need. Shop for, <laughs> it's it's the same company. Shop for a gaming. The NVIDIA card you're talking about. Yeah, the NVIDIA quad. Yeah. Yeah, for the NVIDIA quad uh, cards, and apparently the AMD ones have gotten, uh, have kind of closed the gap and have gotten really competitive. I don't have any experience with it personally, so I can't comment. I have the MD on my machine. It works yeah. great. It's great, yeah. The 1080. But you're working in a virtual environment, so the, the, the yeah. virtual card that you have here works yeah. pretty well. Yeah. And so the drivers that, if I were to take this and set it up in a virtual environment, which is what I'm going to do when I get home, <laughs> um, I ought to be able to uh, download those drivers and install them somehow in this environment and make it make it work. It depends on your virtual environment. We we have two. We had the virtual environment that we started with. It might stop me if this is going too far. Don't forget <laughs> we're all friends here. Um, so we had our, our one virtual environment and learned a lot from this experience. People would open up Enscape, and all of a sudden, stuff would start crashing. So there was a lot of frustration. 
people had deadlines um, to and in the term that we use we were bleeding and we needed to triage so we got four new servers or four new clouds that we call the, the viz clouds um, that were able to disperse to the power users alone uh, on their own to be able to get everybody the access that they needed to so those viz cloud machines are beefed up and ready for doing V-Ray, for doing Enscape, for doing anything that we really throw at it right now. How many video cards are you using on that? I don't know. You don't know. They're virtual. They, yeah, they I know, live but... somewhere else. Um, I could call our, our IT guys. And you don't even know. And get better answers for you. Um, and now that we know that, okay, these, everything works fine with that configuration, great, let's get six more to get, you know, the better, the better access that everybody needs. So that's our, that's our kind of awkward journey through virtualizing our visualization efforts, is that first it went to the need to people, made sure that it worked, and then to, um, and then getting it to a broader one. But what we don't do is allow it for everyone. If you spend all day in CAD and you don't need it, Enscape, you don't get a Viz machine. If you spend all day in Revit without using Enscape, you don't get a Viz machine, you get one of the regular ones. And that's, you know, uh, it's on an as-need basis. And then the as-need is, is getting more and more every day. It's getting, it's growing every day. That looks really cool. Can I get that on my machine? We're able to just expand by a need basis. Um. But so do people use it to show design ideas? Like what, like what if, if more and more people are using, I'm just curious, is it for, like, can you have a meeting and you're going through something live, or do you just create final views? We do like, both, we, okay. do, we do both. So one of the things, um, one of the big asks, um, way, way back in September, um, was, So one of the big asks back in, back in December was, we have a client, they need renders, this is what we would normally pay to have it done out of house. Mm -hmm. Can you beat that in time and quality? And having just gone through a process where, like I said, my, my previous experience at a, at a render house with 3D Studio Max and V-Ray, we would get sent a SketchUp file or a Rhino file or a Revit file and we'd have a team of people breaking it up into better geometry and cleaning it up because SketchUp makes terrible geometry and Revit makes terrible geometry that you're, if you ever try to use it in a polygonal modeler. So all of a sudden it was a cold bucket of ice water. Okay, that's not going to be an option. And what our interiors department was showing was pretty good. So I said, well, why don't we just take what they already have and make it better? We'll stay with Enscape, we'll stay with the SketchUp file, and we'll just make it better. And it was exactly what we needed. Mm -hmm. Client loved it, everybody was happy. So that went from, and they'd only, up to that point, only been using it for design visualization and getting design buy-in and all that kind of stuff and iterating. The iterating part is important. So then we were able to take what had normally just been used for iterations and then use it for final marketing renders. You can use it for both if you're really savvy and really good in Photoshop. Oh, okay, um, so you clean it up with Photoshop after. Okay. Right, yeah, it does. Um, it's also good with your client and you can show, walk them through the building. Right, right. In real time, that they probably are buying it. <coughs> that's a good time you want to show the lighting study you did on that project to start it with some Enscape views and then about how my the design 
also so as an example um, taking Enscape renders and then going taking those into Photoshop and sitting down with our interiors people and guys where do you want where do you want it lit what do you want for lights we want lights here we want wall washes going in this direction we want some wall washes coming from down the stairs and up the stairs these are going to have three sort of pin lights and then the really great part about this conversation was sitting down with a pm and a project manager and then saying okay guys i understand that you want three small lights in here but the way that this thing is lit right now is really soft and smooth and kind of wall washed how do you expect these three things to keep doing that so that kind of takes because our interiors people aren't lighting designers or lighting designers to a point and then they'll sit there and say this is why we need a lighting designer and this is when i start thinking god i should go to grad school <laughs> um, And then looking around the entire space and just doing, you know, draw overs. We don't want wall washes here. We don't want any scalloping. And just being able to like, all right, this just needs to be an overall soft thing. So this is a little combination of Photoshop paint overs on top of landscape renders. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. I just loved it when you showed this to me because it, it showed not just how do we enhance an image to get buy-in from the client, but how do we improve the design? It's about lighting and Right. Yeah, we could we could right. And this this could be printed out and this could be rent pen. I'm just a Photoshop guy, so it never leaves the screen for me. That's that's basically it. All the green in here is Photoshop? Yeah. Uh, why? Why? Yeah. Well, why not to do it in a like in a empirically very uh, Oh, to, right? to, to do the live. Why not to render it? Why, why do it in Photoshop? Um, this was just for quick notes because oh, yeah. it's like 14, and I know that number because when we were done, I said this is 14, and you need these done for tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how many times I said that. Um, <laughs> Um, so it's just easier for you to go. Yeah. yeah, these are yeah. just notes and indications yeah. to say, to sit down with the interiors when they're giving me input on where they want their lights placed. So I can then go back and, because it's, it's faster to me to just draw a green line than it is to, all right, now the light goes here, another light here. Okay. And, so but your final product, you did an end scape. Right. Oh, okay. I think so I, just I, to document the process I so that you can make sure the yeah. interiors and the renderings and yeah. everything the same. Yeah. Um, then from there, we struggled on models where the lighting affects the materials, and then it's like the balance of the light. And I feel like we're not really good at that. And then we're struggling, and then we like, in in Enscape. In Enscape, we're yeah. not of time. Where I'm struggling, and then I'm getting pushed back. I thought it was like doesn't look right. It usually mirrors the reflection. When you look in the reflection, that's where it's the weakest, typically. Be able to scan it to get the quality that we need to put into our renderings. 
So it's it's a baby steps of, of that, but it's a very important topic. Not just how light hits it, but I guess maybe especially how light it hits it, the reflectivity and the texture and, and all of that. Yeah, one of the things that, um, is anybody using Substance Designer or Substance Painter? <laughs> yeah, so um, Enscape is, uh, uses PBR materials. It's physically based, physically based rendering, there's another word for it. Um, but it's become an industry standard all across the board of PBR materials. And it's standard in Unity and Unreal for doing real-time visualizations. It's also in V-Ray, and uh, it's also in Octane. It's basically, like I said, it's an industry standard. It's been adopted all across the board. And what it means is they're energy-conserving materials where light that hits a surface will never bounce back brighter than it originally was. So if you, if you look at a bouncing ball, it'll never bounce higher than it already hit. Light behaves the same way. And for materials, you don't want light to leave it any brighter than it already came in. Um, so that industry standard PBR materials, it's in Enscape, and as a platform, uh, Substance Designer and Substance Painter, which have recently been bought by Adobe, so if you have an Adobe subscription, you now also have Substance Designer and Substance Painter in your toolkit. Definitely go home and work with them. Is that just a map creator? Does it create normal, diffuse, spectral? Creates normal, roughness, metalness, diffuse, base, everything. Pilot? Tiles, is there tiles, a, seamless. A free version of the same software for Windows 10 computers called Materialize, which is people who are interested in that here and it doesn't cost money. Um, the nice thing about Substance Designer is it's node based, it's procedural. If you're familiar with Grasshopper and nodes and procedural workflows, you won't be that lost in Substance Designer. Think about all your Photoshop filters. Instead of working with them in a stack. That's what I mean. It works across nodes and everything feeds into each other. And it's a really amazing system. So you can take all the stuff that's been designed to support video games and and movies and visual effects and use them in your own renders for doing architectural visualizations. Um, and, the, and the great thing about that too, with the material scanning process, that it is, is we're looking at it as the future. Um, it has a pipeline for that. So we're, we're building our own in-house material scanner. It's my little pet project. It's awesome. If, as an integrated firm, this is the joy that I get to have, is that there's electrical engineers down the hall. There's mechanical engineers. And I can look at these guys because I don't know Arduinos, I don't know any of the programming stuff. And our electrical engineer is single and doesn't have any kids, says, yeah, I want to work on this in my spare time. Fantastic. We're all in this together. You know, and our, one of our architects who is really savvy with 3D printers can say, yeah, I can 3D print some parts for this. And we can all come together as a team and also to be able to disperse knowledge in that way. Um, So they, they all know what material properties are now and you can advance the conversation and you know, have a really great shared experience. This is one of the other one of the cool things about having a cloud-based uh, platform. So if your computer shuts down the second you sign back in, I don't know if you guys noticed, everything was still up and hadn't changed.
What do you guys think? I see four laptops and Mine's not gonna work. yours isn't going <laughs> to work. I've seen three laptops. You're in. Do you guys, are you guys cool if I go through and light up a scene? I'd be interested in seeing anything else, yeah. Sure, sure. We're good? All right. Um, I do want to do this first because I know Some of you have asked about polishing up an Enscape render in Photoshop. How and much time do you, do you think you spend on that? It depends. Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's not an easy answer. I mean, I could, I could, I could spend a lot more time. I guess. Well, let's say on that fourteen renderings that you get next night. Yeah, that's when it that's when it comes down to fifteen minutes. Okay. And I'll set it down. There you go. That's a good average. Like, okay, I have fifteen minutes in Photoshop to get. You know, yeah. So, they all know like this will take me three hours. Don't expect it anytime soon. Do you think it's better to entourage in Photoshop than use the Enscape asset people? No, definitely do. I'm glad you asked that. Yes. So regarding entourage and Enscape. Use their plants. Their uh, proxy library has gotten awesome. They went from having like four or five people to having a bunch of people. They went from having a small amount of plants to where it's really competitive with Lumion. And we've completely cut Lumion out of our pipeline altogether. And there was a study about happiness and choice that I, <laughs> that I, that I keep coming back to. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but like you, people are oddly more happy with fewer choices. Mm -hmm. Like Five Guys Burgers, there's like two things on the menu. It's burgers and fries, and people love it. You don't have to, there's not a whole like universe of choices. So, removing Lumion from the conversation has just made everything so much better, so much smoother. We know what we're going to do. It's great. Um, so, well, also with the SketchUp people, if you try to just do a render, they're not. Semi trans, they're not transparent or translucent like that in SketchUp. Yeah. Is there a workaround for that? Yeah, so you render it twice. Okay. Michael knows what I'm talking about. People on, people off. Yeah. Trees on, trees <laughs> off. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my god. Glass on, glass off, too. Oh, we didn't really figure this part out. Let's put a tree in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is where, this is where Enscape still isn't quite where we. It, it's got a few steps to make um, in terms of having like a render pass manager tied into it. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm referring to, like you can fill in the blanks. If you have trees on a layer and your people on a layer, because Enscape renders so fast, you can afford to do this while you're sitting at your desk do a render with the trees, turn the layer off, do another full render, and then when you pull it back into Photoshop, you can either adjust the opacity if you want to ghost your trees, you can turn it off completely, or what I like to do, um, especially with their entourage, it gives you reference for scale and lighting. When you put the people in or when you put the entourage into an Enscape render, it tells you how big it is, it shows you where cast shadows goes, and it will show up in reflections, which is a really difficult thing to do manually. If anybody's ever tried to plot reflections in linear perspective, it will just take you all afternoon. So, so just do it on a layer and then turn it off. Like our bushes here. So, sorry, just one more question. So if you do the people layer separate, would you turn everything else off, but then your people wouldn't have shadows? Or right. do you Photoshop the shadows? What's the best? It's process? a little bit of both. Okay. It's a little, I mean, I wouldn't turn everything else off completely because it, it does give you um, layer masks. So if I can walk back. So there's a couple of photo people. And you can blend in a couple of photo people just to get it to look nice. There's a fake cloud to help balance that out. Um, another render pass. I took this one into Photomatix because I like tone mapping in Photomatix and then brought it back in to just use as a luminance and you can see what it does there. Uh, some color balance stuff on our other foreground person. She's another photo and take out her shadows. 
and some color balance and exposures on her, some gamma adjustments or whatever. You can see a little bit going on on the floor. Painting some of the reflections in. So this sky background, you might recognize the John Hancock building. Um, painting those in. A little bit of an exposure adjustment on the bush. And you can see right here, this is a default Enscape bush. And then that's a photo cutout just placed on top of it but it gives us reference for lighting and scale. So we can just drop something else in. And they also said no up lights on that one, so the lighting got turned up. Are all these layers all different people working on the same project? No. No, these are all just me. Okay. Um, for an integrated workflow like that, like we're, we're kind of taking steps towards it. We don't have a big biz team. It's basically me and, uh, and my, my junior associate, or I don't know what the title is. Um, so right now, yeah, it is just all me. There is, there, I mean, you're familiar with linked files in Photoshop. Yeah, it's, it's getting there. So when you, when you draw into those layers, you're just masking out what you want to affect at that particular event. Right. Um, so these boxwoods on the right, these are all photos, and those were the original landscape ones. And then knowing that there's, you can't see it on the right side, but there's a whole glass wall that's emitting light. Do you ever superimpose line drawings? Yes, sometimes. Superimposing line drawings is great. Um, one, to show that you are still in a design phase. So whatever. <laughs> They know that it's not final and they know that it's not trying to be photorealistic so just throw the line work over it and everybody gets the idea um, i also like to do tricks with the line art um, like invert it so the lines are white and then screen it over mm -hmm. and then do a little composite so it gives little light kicks around stuff that's always a fun thing to do and you can get that out of Enscape. Can you get like an image fusion pass out of Enscape? Not yet. You can sort of cheat it with a light with the line renders and then blur it. Mm. It'll get there. And I, I honestly started looking into like ambient occlusion renderings in SketchUp. Well, I guess there's like a hundred dollar plugin or something that'll do it. Um, yeah, everybody just keeps adding plugins. There's a little bit of atmosphere on that one. Um, and what I'm trying to get down to, yeah, I was gonna show, I guess I baked it down. Um, but the material, the material IDs. No material IDs. <coughs> what are the different channel export options? You get Z depth and material IDs, and that's it. Okay, so not shadows or something like that? You don't get shadows. Okay. There's some creative workarounds if you really want to put the effort in. Um, and you don't get something like a, what is the word for it in V ray? Multi max, <laughs> where it's just RGB. Again, if you break it up into like a three mod or a three material chunk in a scene and then just kind of work your way through and if you really wanted to do it you could if anybody's really savvy with sketchup scripting there might be a really fun cool way to do it um that's my hope that it's coming down the pipe but uh, so anyways yeah that's that's massaging uh enscape renders for more marketing purposes that was great who would be interested in knowing what Enscape has coming down the pipe? If we have a connection to a company, is that something that we as a group want to reach out? Or do you think they know? <laughs> yeah. Just to see what they're exploring. So it's not just us dealing with this new game that they give us every so often, but planning for it.
bits in Germany, really? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. And we still have, like, V-Ray is still part of our pipeline. Is that one client pays more money for the rendering? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you deal with, with Pretty like, pricing much, yeah. that? I don't know. I just keep... You're not wrong. Um, yeah, how is this provided as a, like, what kind of service is Inkscape provided? Is this, like, rendering? Are you charging more for it? Yeah. Or is that it's just a stupid question? No, it's not a stupid no. question. It's pretty legitimate. Um, so far, as part of the design iteration process, it's just sort of been integrated into the rest of the firm. Um, and my role in as the design technologist, I'm not just the architectural illustrator, I'm not just the viz guy. Part of my role here is to be able to teach and work with the rest of the firm, so I'm in this kind of like weird position. Um, so it was a priority for me to know the tools everybody else is using. Um, hence my like, all right, I'm going to do this for the next three months and see what it is and what it does and where it goes. Um, so, so yeah, there's that. And now we're getting to the point where there are some things that Enscape does, like one of the um, exterior renders you might have seen while I was running through images. Layers of glass and layers of transparency at night, it gets a little weird with. So that's something that was like, all right, maybe it's time that we have to start to take this scene into V-Ray, and that's how we'll just keep doing those visualizations moving forward. Um, so they do still kind of have their place. How many bounce passes does it do sort of typically in the, because if you're having several layers like that, does it just sort of cap out at a certain point where it gives up? I'm, I'm glad you asked. A uh, couple of things to note. The emissive materials uh, have one less bounce than their artificial lights. So keep that in mind. The emissive material, if you put it on a light, on an object and try to light something with it, because that's what I did when I first started using it, I was like, oh, it's a path tracer. I can just use emissive materials on everything right. and this will be a great workflow. Um, and then a couple of people were like, hey, how come you don't have any shadows in your scene? I was like, of course there are shadows. <laughs> no, there are no shadows here. Okay, this is a problem. Um, so one of the things you'll note is that their artificial lights catch shadows where the emissive materials don't. At all. Right. The emissive materials do not catch shadows at all, only the artificial lights. Their artificial materials, they just assume that you're going to use those for things like computer monitors, TV screens, cell phones, yeah. tail lights, um, and that you'll just use their artificial lights for everything else that's major. All right, so a little bit of workshop stuff here. You guys all have. I only brought four, one over there. Um, and some business cards. So if you shoot me in an email, uh, I can send you the OneDrive that these things are also living on. Anybody need it? We're good. One, two, three, four. Cool. Thank you, sir. All right. Can you synchronize the view in SketchUp and Enscape or not yet? Yes. So this little camera guy that says synchronize views, bam. So if you have <laughs> if you have your SketchUp scenes set up, that's a pretty great way to work. Um, otherwise, if you just fly around and do a bunch of renders at random, and then your interiors department comes back and says, "Okay, we want that view." <laughs> All right, uh, let me <laughs> re refigure out that scene. Can you also create a SketchUp view from Enscape? Like, um, SketchUp view from Enscape. No, it doesn't work both ways. 
So that with that view, you have on your left now. If you, so to take it to go to Photoshop now, what would you do? Like if you were okay, it's right here. Where you, you, where, you, where do you yeah, render like from? Export. Where do you render from? Uh, um, where do we go? Where do we actually do this stuff? Um, Inscape capturing. Okay. So this guy comes over. So you can dock him up there. It's just this button that says render image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things to keep in mind. If I open up my Enscape settings, under Capture, you have the option to export material ID and depth channel. So I'll turn that on and then figure out the depth range. It's in meters. Thanks, Germans. It'd be nice if we had some feet so I don't have to go into Google conversions. Um, you should convert to meters. <laughs> the US yeah. has changed the metric system. That's right. <laughs> um, so your file format options, PNGs, if you don't mind larger formats that sometimes open up in weird programs. I got barked at the other day for doing things in PNGs. J <coughs> JPEGs are normal. Everybody knows JPEGs. They're fine. Uh, and our open EXRs. How many of you guys are working in open EXRs? Just one? Aw. Two? Yeah, well, I know you. <laughs> That's it? <coughs> How many of you guys are familiar with 32 bit nonlinear workflows? Not really, though. No. All right, we'll have to come back. Um, so, open, open EXR is just a real brief, quick. Uh, it's linear, it's floating point, they're going to be larger, but they're also going to contain all of the light data in the scene and whatever adjustments that you make in Photoshop are going to be much more flexible. Um, and if you have an HDR monitor, shoot me an email because I've never seen one in real life. <laughs> You're buying lunch. <laughs> um, so, all right, so we choose our file format, the automatic naming or the default folder. Um, you can always work with that. And the video compression quality, maximum or lossless, uh, usually leave that one at maximum so it doesn't screw anything up. Frames per second, I'll usually leave that at 30 in case there needs to be some retiming. Um, and then the panorama resolution for doing 360s, your low, normal, high. So when it actually comes out, from our guy up here that says render image. Just throw this onto the desktop real quick. And I'll just do this BSA example. And it's that fast. So you can look at our BSA example. There he is, nice, crisp, and clean. Um, one of the other things to note under the capture, the resolution right now is set to the window. This will trip you up. All, there's a couple, I, I need two things. I know I'm supposed to be doing the workshop portion right now, but keep running into this stuff we have to go over. Um, the, the resolution of whatever crazy proportion that this is. I don't know how that's an option or why it's an option. It's there to trip you up. Set this to something specific, like custom, like a nice 1920 by 1080. That's fantastic. Work looks great in a PowerPoint. Clients are never gonna know the difference. Um, for the marketing stuff, multiply that by three. So it becomes like 5,600 by 3,240. I don't think those numbers are right, but you can, at least on my beefy 1080 Ti graphics card, get over 5,000 by 3,000 out of Enscape, and it doesn't take too much longer. Those are pretty big files. So just as a warning about resolution and all that stuff. Um, so we get our, our normal RGB pass and our material IDs, because we only have one, two, three, four material IDs. And our Z depth pass, which isn't that bad. 
Um, and just in case anybody is wondering, like Matt, again, why are you scripts, load file in the stack? I'm just going to browse to the desktop real quick. Grab all three. And it loads all three files into Photoshop automatically. You don't have to do anything crazy. I love that. That's my favorite feature. My workflow for doing a lot of this stuff is to just keep leaving this material ID pass at the top. And then I'll do, just as an example, we'll just grab a curves, turn off the material ID, and now whatever has that gray material, I can affect just that. We'll do that again. We'll turn my material ID on. I have contigu or contiguous is turned off, so it's only selecting that. Turn it off, and I'll go to curves again and it automatically creates a mask that's only affecting the monitors right now and now I can grab that and boost up the brightness so it looks like they're emitting something right I can grab just the windows because the windows are always or anything that doesn't have geometry is going to come out as black again grab that back into curves, make those even brighter or even darker or do whatever I want to. And you guys saw that roof deck thing. The edges can get a little jaggy sometimes, the way that this works. Um, if you have a bunch of materials and a bunch of stuff, you just sort of got to work with it as best you, as you can to a certain point. And that's one of the things of working at 5,000 by 3,000 or as you know, giant resolutions, and then crunch it down to that 1920 by 1080 for the web that your client's marketing department is going to use. All that stuff just magically disappears in the compression, so it all comes out in the wash. It's not bad. And then every once in a while, we can talk about some other tips and tricks for filling in, doing a wrap light or a light wrap, and some other things. Um, and if you're curious, if this is your first time seeing what a, uh, a Z depth pass does. You invert it, set it to screen, and I'll do this with levels right now. Hold down Option or Alt so it's only affecting what's going on here. And it just gives a little bit of atmosphere. This probably isn't the best scene to do it. Outdoor scenes, obviously. Um, if you want some nice atmosphere and mood. But even on large interiors, you'd be surprised how much a good Z-Depth Pass will add some much needed depth and a little bit of realism to it. Even on interiors, like a large lobby space, you know, anything over 40 feet, 40 feet plus, it's a good thing to have. And you can also, with some tricks, use, use the Z-Depth as another masking agent to do some other things. Um, all right. So we're back with our, our fake warehouse scene here and our Enscape scene. And to sort of relight this thing, if I delete those lights out, I'm going to set my time down to nothing. Grab my materials. And where did my escape guys go? Escape. Oh, they're right there. I'm just going to turn off the illumination on that. Now my scene has gone completely black, which is a good thing. We know that we're starting from a neutral, from a neutral stance here. Um, and one thing to consider, we'll circle back to it, 
it does have a problem with light leaks. There is a uh, Enscape presentation that's floating around on the internet where they go through this whole thing about how they achieve their their hybrid process um, and the light leaks of global illumination in real time is it's one of their challenges. So if you model properly and everything is a nice component and you make, let's just do this. Oops. The lights will propagate to all of the other components. So if I create my rectangle light, and you can see where it's got a little bit of Z fighting. Sometimes we look back at our scene, the whole rest of the scene is being illuminated. What we're not seeing is the light fixtures, hence the illuminous material. So if I jump back into here, grab those guys, and then just paint that light panel material back on, or even turn our self-illumination on. Now you can see that surface as a visibly illuminating object and it's casting lights that are casting shadows. Right now the luminance is over 5,000 candelas, so I'll just turn that down to something reasonable. Um, and you can turn it down really low. Now you can see where the shadows are being cast. And you can see that a surface is emitting light. And I kind of purposely left this scene as being gray, so we can focus on just the lighting aspect of this. Um, so we've got five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Last, uh, what's what? the camera you're using? Like, where do you adjust the ISO? No ISO, oh, okay. there's no, it, it gives you other general